We'll be reading again Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. We want to look again about the uh, parable of going down to the potter's house, hearing the word of the Lord, what God had to say. And, of course, everything he had to say had to do with the process of the potter uh, creating a vessel on the wheel out of a lump of clay. It's a clear illustration, of course, of the working of God in the life of a person who yields to his will in their life. And there's several other things we didn't cover this morning. I want to look at in Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Would you stand as the scriptures read, please? The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the lessons you give us, the straightforward lessons the visual helps that you give us with the parables and the object lessons. Remind us of these things when we need them the most. Show us very clearly the lessons of your hand working in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Go down to the potter's house and I'll show you my words. So he had a message in the potter's house, but as we look at this past scripture, when Jeremiah went to the potter's house, the clay was already on the wheel, and the potter was already working on the clay that was on the wheel. But we have to understand this whole process has something to do with God's working in my life. So we understand we look at the preparation of the clay before it reaches the wheel, and there's a beautiful lesson here. If you do some research and understand how pottery was made and how the clay was prepared before he even reached the wheel. There's a beautiful lesson of God's working in our lives. First of all, the potter would get the clay, and before he did anything else, there would be foreign objects removed from the clay. Any foreign object that was in the clay would cause a problem if he wanted to form this clay. Any kind of stones or any sort of objects that had gotten in there, he would remove them out of there. And then there was water added to soften the clay. There's a particular type of clay that the potter wanted, but a lot of times he would put water in there and mix that water in there to soften the clay. Now the lesson here is this. The potter will assist in making the clay as pliable as possible. Now the word pliable means easily shaped. He needs clay that is easily shaped and he doesn't just pick up a lump of clay and says, oh I can't use that. He'll make sure that he inspects it for foreign material, and then he makes sure that he adds the necessary water to it to soften it up. He'll assist the clay in being compliant and shaped into what he wants it to be. And God will help us. When we really want to be shaped to his will, he will help us become more easily shaped to his will. Now, the impurities are removed. How is that done? Well, look that up. And a lot of times, the lump of clay is submerged in water. And that water, uh, for quite some time, will soak in there, and it will remove the impurities. Now, these impurities may just simply be the chemical makeup of that clay, and it will remove some of the things he does not want in the clay because there's a specific consistency that he wants. So we understand when it comes to usefulness in God's work, and that's what we're dealing with when we talk about a lump of clay being shaped and what the potter wants it to be, we're talking about usefulness. When we're talking about usefulness in God's work, cleanliness is vital. Cleanliness is vital. And God does what it takes to get those impurities out of our life. Then thirdly, 
unwanted air pockets are removed. Now, simply because an air bubble, no matter how small in that clay, will cause a weak spot in it. And the potter does not want weak spots in a vessel that he wants to use. Now, all of us have weak spots. And God, of course, like the clay, the potter in the clay, knows our weak spots. We often know our weak spots too. We're painfully aware of them. Sometimes we're not. But the potter wants to remove those air bubbles. How is that done? Well, there's a passage of scripture that deals with another subject in Isaiah chapter 41, if you want to be turning to verse 25, that gives us an insight as exactly, exactly how the potter removed the air bubbles from the lump of clay. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 25, and he's, he's not even talking about the potter directly. He's using the potter as an illustration of something else that's happening. But in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 25, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun. He shall call on my name. He will come against princes as through mortar, as the potter treads the clay. The potter treads the clay. Now, if you look at the technical term for that, when that lump of clay is worked over, for the air bubbles to be removed, it's called, it's wedged. But what happens is the potter places this clay in a, a, a confined area and then he walks on it, he steps on it, and he steps on it some more, and then he steps on it some more. Now, to the casual observer, they would say, well, that guy doesn't think a lot of that clay. Look at him, he's just stomping on it. He's stomping on that clay. That poor clay, he's just, he's, look at him, he's just working it over. And surely he's about to quit. No, he just keeps on and keeps on and keeps on. But he keeps walking through that clay. It looks like he's harming the clay. But he's simply making it stronger by getting the air bubbles out. Looks like he's mistreating the clay. But he's making it stronger. Many times events happen in our life and we want to say, God, why are you doing this to me? Could be God's walking the air bubbles out of our life. Or you have to apply some pressure to that clay to move those air bubbles out. And as he does that, that just makes the clay stronger and stronger. Then after you get the clay all worked up, you've gotten it softened up, you've gotten the impurities out of it, you've gotten the air bubbles out of it, it's time to go to work. The placement on the wheel is very important. Sometimes if you've heard of, of hand-thrown clay pots, part of that has to do with how he puts it on the wheel. He puts it on the wheel by lifting it up and then throwing it down on the wheel. He doesn't place it on the wheel. He more or less plops it on the wheel. And we, I, maybe if we call it a hand-plopped clay jar, it might be a little bit more understandable to us. But he plops it on the wheel. Now, what's important about that? He wants to create as much contact with the wheel as possible. Because, you see, the hand of the potter is very much involved with the shaping of the vessel, but that wheel is very much involved as well. And for that vessel to be shaped and worked in what it needs to be, it has to have good, firm contact with the wheel because the wheel is as much a part of the action as anything else. And let me give you a word about the wheel. Now, I believe the King James Version says, and I saw him with a work on the wheels, plural. You see, the Hebrew is actually dual. The Hebrew word actually means dual wheel. Here's, of course, the structure of the potter's wheel. There's on the bottom of this table, down on the ground, suspended in a, a spindle, is a large, heavy stone wheel. An axle will connect that stone wheel to the lighter weight wooden wheel that the clay is on. And what happens is this, is the potter will turn that 
bottom wheel with his feet. Why is it heavy stone wheel? Well, those of you who know a little bit things about mechanics, you know about a flywheel. A heavy flywheel will keep things turning once you get it going because when he starts applying pressure to that clay, he needs, of course, some momentum, that heavy stone wheel. But now the, the potter will turn that with his feet. So we understand if that clay is in contact with his wheel, that clay is just in as much contact with the working of the potter than if it's on his hand because the potter's in control of it all. The potter is control of the wheel you can see. And the potter is in control of the wheel you can't see because you understand it from the clay's perspective. From the clay's perspective, all that's visible is the top wheel. From the clay's perspective, life seems a lot like our life sometimes. Going around in circles. That clay is plopped on that wheel if the clay could talk it's like oh okay this is not too bad then it goes to spinning around hey what's wrong i'm just going around in, and i'm going faster going around in circles what's going wrong actually nothing's going wrong you see the wheel that is unseen is controlling what we do see and all that momentum is part of god shaping our life you see we we can see the events that happen to us. That's the top wheel. But you see, the events that happen to us are all controlled by that bottom wheel we can't see. And the hand of God that we can't see brings these things into our life that sometimes look like chaos. And I think all of us know about life going around in circles. Man, I've been here before. I just keep, I don't seem to be making any progress. Well, that pot goes around in circles, and those, those circles and those revolutions are all in the control of the master. And then we have the finishing touch. Look this up. I wanted to see exactly how clay was made in the potter in the Bible times. After the potter has made this clay into the vessel that he wants, it needs to dry for a bit before anything else happens. So this potter will put that clay usually in a very dark, cool place like a cave. Put it away. It's dark in here. It's lonely in here. A lot of times we go through these dark places, but he has to do it so it'll dry slowly. So he puts it away. And that clay has some time alone. And you see, those times are important in our life. Yes, there are times of busyness, going around in circles. Let's get things done. But we all know in the Bible how many times it says, be still and know I'm God. And so that clay is just put away in a quiet place for a while. But that quiet place for a while prepares it for what's coming next. What's coming next takes that clay pot and he puts it in a kiln. He puts it in the fire. If it hadn't have been in that quiet place first, the fire would just destroy it and crack it. But when it's put in that dry, that cool, dry place first and then put in the fire, the fire just makes it stronger. And again, an uneducated, unformed observer would say, what, what's he doing? It's burning it up. He spent so much time on it. He's, he's going to burn it up. Oh, no. We all know that firing the pot finishes it off. It puts the finishing touch. All this shaping, all this concern about the clay being just right, when it is fired to just the right temperature, and there was a precise temperature and there was a precise length of time it had to be put in there it makes that clay even in its most fragile state as strong as it possibly could be because the potter knows for whatever he's going to use that vessel for it's going to have to have a particular amount of strength and he knows in other words for that to be strong enough to hold up and not crumble it's got to be put through the fire and the lesson is obvious isn't it when we go through the fire, 
Sometimes it's prone to say, is, is God mad at me? Well, God puts us in the fire to make us stronger and make us better. Passages of Scripture in the book of 1 Peter, probably saw this one coming, but I want to close out with this one because there are two references in the book of 1 Peter to fire. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6. In this, talking about salvation and the working of God, you greatly rejoice, though for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I know he's talking about gold here, but gold, like a clay pot, is made better when it is finished with the fire. And then in chapter 4, verse 12, he says this, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Don't think it's strange when you go through a fiery trial. In other words, everything hadn't gone wrong, even though it's a fiery trial. Life hadn't come unraveled, even though it's a fiery trial. You see, when we look at the potter and the clay, everything's going right. Now, would it be pleasant for the clay? Absolutely not. Is it pleasant for us when we go through fiery trials and they can take any kind of shape? Absolutely not. And he knew that when he was talking to these Christians. And they were going through some fiery trials, literally, with the persecution of Nero. But he said, you can rejoice because God's in control of the wheel. God's in control of the clay. And God's in control of the fire. You see, a life that's yielded to the will of God, God is in control of every step of the process of making that clay into something useful. And every step of that process tells us something about his dealings in our life that sometimes may look a bit, we don't have the answers to that. But understand, the potter has the answers to the process. Anything before we close? Let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank you for coming back to church tonight. Y'all be careful out there. The flu has flown and several people have gotten it, but we're going to pray that all of us can stay well and uh, be in prayer for these prayer requests. We got a lot of folks that are in need. Anything before we dismiss? If not, Brother Jared, would you dismiss us, please, sir?